In 1988, the people of a quiet village in Merseyside were left reeling when a young woman vanished without trace on her way back from work. It was hard to believe that something like that would happen in a, in a village like Berlin's. A huge search was mounted, and despite the whole village being involved, she wasn't found. And I thought, there's something seriously wrong here, and I knew she wasn't coming home. A murder investigation was launched, but would they be able to bring the killer to justice? That's all I want, is for him to end this nightmare. is a large village around 15 miles east of Liverpool. Historically a mining community, it's home to around 6,000 people. Billinge is a, a small town stroke village um, which is uh, straddling the boroughs of Wigan and St Helens. The village has several churches and pubs and a number of shops. It's just a very close-knit community. Um, a lot of customers who come in here, they know each other, they have a chat. It's a place for them to meet up. I've lived here since I was born, so I've been 20 years now. And uh, for as long as I've lived here, it's just been a nice, quiet area. Nothing really goes on. It's just a friendly place, really. It's got loads of nice green spaces. There's nice parks here, the schools are lovely. It's got a lovely countryside. I mean, it's a nice place. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else but here. Mary McCourt moved to Billinge in 1980 with her two children and soon settled into village life. Her daughter Helen worked in Liverpool and on Tuesday the 9th of February 1988, Mary had planned to meet her for lunch. I had arranged to meet Helen because I was taking my mum to the eye hospital next door to where she worked. So Helen said, well, come down, mum, and I'll take you all out for lunch, and then we can all go home together. But severe storm warnings made Mary rethink her plans. She decided it was safer not to wait around in Liverpool and went straight home instead. Hi, mum. Yeah, 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 no, it's me again. <laughs> Helen rung yeah. to see how her nan was, how she got on, yeah. and then she rang back again yeah, yeah, yeah. to ask would I have her meal ready for her because she was going out with her boyfriend. All right then, let me do. Bye, mom. Bye. She rang about three times, and on the last time she said, you won't forget to have me tea ready, will you, mum? And I said, I know my memory's bad, love, but it's not that bad. Helen's commute involved getting a train from Liverpool and then a bus from nearby St Helens. Excited about her date that evening, she hoped to be back by 5.15. Around about 22, quarter to six, I was in the kitchen and I heard on the news that the trains from Liverpool to uh, Wigan had been delayed because a tree had been blown onto the line. Knowing that there were transport problems, Mary wasn't overly concerned that Helen was running late. It wasn't until her son Michael had returned home at 7pm as planned that Mary started to become worried. I started to panic and I thought, well, let her run British Rail. They asked what stop was she getting off at and when I told them St Helens, they said, oh, it won't have affected her train, those trains were running on time. That is when I thought, what happened to her? Why hasn't she not? It was completely out of character that Helen would be missing. It's the days before mobile phones, but Helen would always find a phone somewhere to let her mother know where she was, you know, what time she would be in. It was now 8 p.m. and Helen had been missing for almost three hours. That evening, we put calls in to her work. Is she working late or...? 
to the Georgian Dragon pub. I just wondered if you'd seen her. No. To a couple of friends in Liverpool. I just wondered if she was round at, at yours. And two of the local hospitals, just in case she'd have been admitted there. No one had seen Helen, so Mary, John and Helen's boyfriend Frank decided to go into Liverpool to look for her. I waited in the house while my mum went into Liverpool to retrace Helen's steps. As it got later and later, you get more concerned. As my mum phoned up each time, she said, you know, she's not found her. As she come home and no, she hadn't come back. So as the night gets on, you do start to worry and thinking, well, there's something wrong here. Sometime after 10.30 p.m., Mary went into a police station in the center of Liverpool to report Helen missing. I think they thought I was probably one of those overprotective mums because when they said, how old is your daughter? And I said, 22. And they went, oh, she's probably heard that the trains are delayed and she's gone for a drink with her colleagues. But Mary knew her reliable daughter wouldn't have done that without calling her first. Seeing Mary's distress, the desk sergeant put out a call to all the officers on the beat. I was pleased because I thought she could be laying injured in the street somewhere and maybe a piece of fallen masonry could have hit her on the head and she could have been unconscious. And I just kept thinking if she's laying out there injured somewhere, she's going to be freezing cold and hoping that somebody was going to find her. But Helen was nowhere to be seen, and as dawn broke, two officers came round to the house. And that was the start of the nightmare for me, and I knew it was serious. Helen had been missing all night, and the officers were becoming increasingly concerned for her. The first steps that the police took were to establish Helen's movements from her place of work. So inquiries were initiated to try and establish people who'd seen her on the bus or the train. It was such a short space of time that she'd been missing. It was only 12 hours. They were able to speak with her work colleagues, the ones who'd seen her leaving the building, people who were on the train. So the police were very quickly able to say where Helen sat on the train, who saw her, who was on the bus that she travelled on, where she sat, who she spoke to. And the last sighting of Helen was getting up at the bus at her stop, walking round the corner in the direction of her home, less than 250 yards from where we live, a quarter past five. And that was the last sighting of her. it would seem that Helen had vanished. Whilst the police were trying to establish her last known movements, 15 miles away, a dog walker made a discovery. He'd found these items of clothing, and it was men's clothing. It was jeans that were concertina, like somebody had just stepped out of them. There were a couple of pillowcases, some towels, socks, a sweatshirt with the words Labatt on it, and he went home told his wife and he said that was human blood on these things so he rung the police. The area where the clothes were found came under Cheshire police force so no connection to the missing Merseyside girl was made at that time. It had now been more than 24 hours and Helen still wasn't home. I remember it being on the 10 o'clock news um, about the police were concerned for a local girl and that's that's when you think there is something wrong because things like that don't happen to you. It doesn't happen to us. The police investigation into Helen McCourt's disappearance had discovered that she'd caught her bus as planned and had last been seen just yards from her home around 5.15 p.m. Helen was a creature of habit. There weren't many variables that could have got in the way of her getting home. People knew she got off the bus pretty quickly. And uh, for her to have disappeared in such a, a short space of time and such a geographical small area raised the alarm and concerns for the police. 
So where was Helen? Her close family and friends weren't able to give the police any clues to her whereabouts. So on Thursday morning, a day and a half after she'd been last seen, they started door-to-door -door inquiries. It was decided by the senior investigating officer that um, uh, calls would be made at each of the premises, whether they be business premises or uh, private addresses, uh, on the route between the bus stop and Helen's home address. They decided to pay particular attention to any where there was a male either in on their own or living on their own. 120 police were brought into the Billinge area to conduct house-to-house -house searches and other inquiries. Have you seen anything suspicious on your property? There was an awful lot of uniform police presence knocking on various doors, searching garages. I remember looking through the, the kitchen window and seeing the police uh, searching through all the leaves that had accumulated over the winter months. I remember being 11 and watching the police look under bushes and things, and it was like a big deal then. He was like really curious over what was going on. He knew something bad had happened sort of thing, but nobody actually knew what at that point. One of the places that Helen would have walked past was her local pub, the Georgian Dragon. Helen drank in there regularly, and two days before her disappearance, she'd been involved in an incident when a girl spilled her drink over her. The girl was drunk, she said. She'd had too much to drink. It was an accident, and the drink went over me. She said, I went out the toilet. She came in the toilet. I thought she was going to go for me hair, so I just grabbed her by her wrists and I was holding her like that. She said, when Ian Sims come in and took hold of her and told me to get me coat and go. Ian Sims was the landlord of the pub and Helen told her mum that he'd barred her that night. As part of their routine investigations into Helen's disappearance, the police spoke to him. Are you the landlord? Yes. Uh... He was just very matter of fact, you know, there was no concern, there was nothing to cause them any alarm, other than when they said, your pub is getting busy and we'd need to ask questions further down at the station. Can you get somebody to look after your pub? And that is when he panicked. He started hyperventilating. One of the police officers had a degree in psychology. And as soon as he started asking certain questions, this hyperventilation started, and he thought, well, something's wrong here. Well, Helen went missing on the 9th, and we need to establish where he was that evening. I probably have to consult my diary on that one. Once at the station, Ian Sims was questioned about his movements the evening Helen went missing. He explained his whereabouts by saying that he was with a friend. People actually seeing you come in. Ian Sims lived in the flat above the pub for security purposes, while his wife and children lived in a house nearby. He admitted to the police that he'd been having an affair, and on the evening of Helen's disappearance, he'd met up with his mistress as normal at 7pm. So the police questioned his mistress to hear her version of events. When we spoke to her and interviewed her, she actually said that she'd received a whispered phone call from, uh, from Ian Sims during the course of which she asked her not to come at her normal time, but rather to come at half past eight in the evening. And uh, when she arrived shortly after half eight, uh, despite the fact that um, Ian had asked her to, uh, to come round some, somewhat later than uh, she would have been expected to arrive, he still wasn't there. And in fact, he didn't return to the public house, as I'm led to believe, until sometime around about 20 past 10 that evening. Ian Sims' alibi didn't check out, but that wasn't the only reason for officers to be concerned. Ian Sims was seen to have scratch marks to his neck, um, so the police were obviously concerned as to how he had come by the scratches and asked him about them, and he initially said that uh, they'd been caused as a result of an argument with his wife. Ian Sims said his wife had attacked him after he'd admitted he was having an affair. But when questioned, his wife said this wasn't true. 
when we spoke to Ian again about the scratches on his neck, he said that um, they'd been caused during the course of him separating um, two people who were having an argument in the Georgian Dragon. Uh, one of those people, by coincidence, was Helen. We knew that Helen was missing, so we spoke to the other woman involved who said that she hadn't caused the scratches to his neck. Nothing that Ian Sims was saying was ringing true. And while he was making his formal statements, a team of officers were forensically searching the pub. They actually found blood staining within the premises and they found fingerprints attributable to Ian Sims in blood inside the premises. The officers also searched Ian Sims' car. Inside the boot of the vehicle, there was an earring uh, which didn't contain a back. It was a, a backless earring. It had now been just over 48 hours since Helen had been last seen. The family had just returned home from church where they'd been praying for her safe return when officers arrived at the house. They showed me an earring and a little glass or plastic vial and asked, had I, could I identify that earring? I, and I remember looking at it and saying, Yes, it's identical to the earrings Helen was wearing. When they showed the earring, I thought they banned her. Sadly, the backless earring was all they had found of Helen's. For her family and her best friend, Janet Bailey, the severity of the situation was starting to sink in. It became a bit more real. And you still had the hope that it was just an accident and that she would come back. But hope of finding Helen alive was now fading. The earring, the unidentified blood in the pub, and Sim's lack of an alibi led the police to make a bold decision in the early hours of Friday morning. On the 12th of February, the police felt they had enough evidence to charge Ian Sims with the murder of Helen McCourt. He simply replied, I didn't do it. 22-year-old Helen McCourt vanished just yards from her home after getting off a bus on Tuesday the 9th of February 1988. Three days later, the police had charged the local pub landlord with her abduction and murder, despite not yet having found her body. I'd just moved in the area. It was awful, really. Everybody was in shock and couldn't believe what had happened. It was hard to believe that something like that would happen in a, in a village like Berlin, you know. The police launched their murder investigation. Even though I knew a hair earring had been found, and I knew Ian Sims by that time had been charged with Helen's murder, it wasn't something I wanted to accept. But as the evidence mounted, hope of finding Helen alive was fading. A number of forensic discoveries were made in the pub, including blood on the flat door, on a hinge, on the stairs, and in the back bedroom. And one of these blood splatters had a fingerprint in it. The fingerprint was found to be Ian Sims, and the family was slowly having to come to terms with the painful fact that Helen wasn't coming home. She was always very outgoing. She was always very, very capable. She loved little practical jokes. She'd come up to the window and go boo when I'd be sat watching television. My heart would be in my mouth. Helen was on the go all the time, socialising, arranging social events, go to parties with her, and she'd just disappear, mingling with people. She seemed to get on with everybody. Helen's younger brother, Michael, was only 19 when Helen disappeared. For me, it was always Helen's smile um, and just the voice. She was always happy in her voice, even when she was waking me up to get to work every morning. She was bright, bubbly. She always had time for people. If I never needed anything, Helen was there. She was my big sister who looked after me at that age. My little brother was always in her thoughts and she was very close with her mum as well. Her mum was a friend as well as being a mum to her. Janet met Helen when they worked together in 1984. She was always very loyal to her friends, um, very happy 
um, a pleasure to be with, really, because she always made you feel good. But Helen's body still hadn't been found, and the police had charged Ian Sims with her murder. Ian Sims was the local landlord of our pub, um, a bit arrogant, um, always liked to flirt with the ladies. He took over the lease of the pub in 1987, and the traditional public house had been turned into a theme pub. To Michael and Helen, the pub was their social centre. There was no youth clubs, etc., in the village, and all the young people used to gather in the pub because it was effectively a, a fun pub. The pub itself was so close, it was our local. Um, me and me mates used to always meet there on Friday and Saturday night, that's where we used to drink. If Helen was in there, she'd always meet up with us. When I first heard that the landlord of the pub in Sims had been taken in for question, I wasn't surprised by that. He had a reputation in the village as he was a bully. Um, he started off as a doorman on the pub. Ian Sims was a bodybuilder, he enjoyed Thai boxing, and it was said locally that he fancied himself as a ladies' man. Although the police had Ian Sims in custody, he was still denying any involvement in Helen's disappearance. They needed to find her body or any clues that would lead to it. On the 12th of February, the man leading the investigation made a general appeal for members of the public to join in a mass search the following day. An amazing 2,000 people turned up. I remember going up there and there was people on the road where coaches had come from all over the northwest. And it was just literally going through down the bridal paths, the pathways, just looking for anything at all that might have a connection with her, anything that she might have worn. They gave everyone descriptions of what clothing she had on. Despite covering a wide area, the search by Merseyside police didn't reveal any new clues as to Helen's whereabouts. But some items of men's clothing covered in blood had been found by a neighbouring force the morning after Helen had gone missing. It was put by the desk of one of the forensic scientists and he was the man who'd found the earring in Ian Sims' car. And when he opened this bag, which just by sheer coincidence was put by his desk, when he opened it up, I think one of the first things he pulled out was the little sweatshirt and he made the connection right away with Helen's case because he'd been into the pub and seen all these Labatt promotion things all around the walls. The sweatshirt may have linked the clothing to the pub, but the officers now needed to link the blood on the clothing to Helen. They had no samples of her blood to test it against, so had no choice but to rely on a new technique familial DNA testing. It was still in its infancy in the late 1980s, but the senior officer on the case was determined to try it. At the time, it was a case of, well, anything we need to do, we would do. Um, I wasn't sure how it would help the police, uh, but we just did it in the hope that something good could come of it. The officers hoped that by taking blood samples from Helen's immediate family, and using genetic fingerprinting, they would be able to prove if the unidentified blood on the clothes, in the pub, and also some traces found in the boot of Ian Sims' car was Helen's. The blood from the various scenes uh, was uh, forensically examined and it was revealed that the blood would have been attributable to a child who'd come from uh, a relationship between Helen McCourt's parents. The new DNA technology had shown that there was an extremely high possibility that the unidentified blood was Helen's. As well as the DNA evidence, new witnesses had come forward. Minutes after Helen had got off the bus, a man getting off another bus in Billinge Town Centre later reported that he heard a scream come from the Georgian Dragon pub, uh, which was cut off abruptly as if a hand had been clamped over someone's mouth. Um, a short time later, the manager of the adjoining restaurant 
uh, also heard the sounds of cleaning coming from inside a pub, the pub which was unusual at that time of day. The pub was normally cleaned first thing in the morning, so the pub's cleaner was questioned about what she'd seen the morning after Helen's disappearance. To her surprise, found a rather grubby-looking Ian Sims scrubbing. She would usually expect him to have been in bed uh, at that time of the day. He claimed that uh, his dog had made a mess and he was trying to clear it up. Um, she also noticed that uh, some new cleaning materials had appeared since she was last there. It appeared that someone had bought new bin bags and some more bleach. The police were gathering a lot of circumstantial evidence, but still didn't have what they really needed to be able to convict Ian Sims. Almost a month had gone by and still there was no sign of where Helen's body lay. But then another breakthrough came when a man walking near Earlham swimming baths close to the River Irwell found a woman's handbag. He looked inside it and recognised something with Helen McCourt's photograph on it, so he immediately contacted the police. The handbag had been found about 20 miles from Helen's home. The police descended on the area and made more significant discoveries, including most of Helen's clothing, the other earring that was missing, and a piece of electrical flex. The police knew that Helen had visited a chemist just before she boarded her bus on the day she disappeared. And along with her clothing, they not only found her receipt, but all the items she had bought bar one. As the search for Helen continued, forensic teams returned once again to the Georgian Dragon, where they found the one item from the receipt from the chemist shop, which wasn't found by the River Irwell, a toothbrush, which was found in the flat. Also found was in the carpet was a butterfly clip from the earring found in his boot and also a small clump of Helen's hair. Mary was asked if she recognised the clothing the officers had found. I identified them, yes, it was a coat. Her scarf, permits, a handbag, her, her boots, her shoes, what she took with her to wear in the office, and her crossword things, because she used to run jury do them on the train. It was the first time that I caved in and just went bizarre. I don't, I don't know what happened. I know they had to get the doctor out to me and he gave me an injection. And it only knocked me out for about two or three hours. And when I woke up, I was screaming again. My mum was here, everybody. You always hope that they are going to come home, you know? Um, that was, the realisation was there. Then police finding the clothes just brought it home more. We knew we wouldn't find her alive. So where was Helen's body? Later in the investigation, a shovel was found at Rixton in Warrington, which wasn't too far from where Helen's clothes had been found. Uh, this turned out to belong to Ian Sims too. Uh, this prompted further police investigations, uh, even resorting to getting bulldozers to skim the top off a farmer's field in the hope of finding her body. But again, the search was fruitless. Ian Sims was still in custody protesting his innocence. So the police really needed to find Helen's body to prove that he'd murdered her. For her family, they just wanted to be able to recover her body so they could say goodbye. We had chest waders and we went through the Manchester Ship Canal and streams in winter, uh, being held on by rope and smashing the ice. Um, we went through um, down a mine shaft where we had to crawl along a small mine shaft because we knew at the time he could have had access or that's what we were told. Any work that was needed to be done as a family, we went and done it. My brothers, my cousins, my uncles, my friends, people in the village were all going out week in, week out searching for Helen. The searching was awful. It was um, probably the worst thing you could do 
because it's something you want to do and you get up knowing you want to do it each day but you knew the end result for the searching to stop you're going to find the body and while I was searching I wanted to be that person although I knew if it was me well, how I'd be uh, you know, I didn't know but that was that was the mindset at the time that we, this is what we were going to do we had to be professional and we knew what the end result was hopefully going to be and hopefully is the wrong word but that's what we were set out to do and no matter where we went it got searched but so far it was to no avail Ian Sims had been in custody for a year and was about to go on trial but with no body would the police be able to get a conviction Ian Sims had been charged with the murder of Helen McCourt despite no body being found. And in February 1989, the case went before a jury at Liverpool Crown Court. For the family, it was a difficult time. You could feel the tension building within the family, what's going to happen, you know, is the landlord going to say anything about what he'd done? Is he going to plead guilty? Is he going to say where Helen is? Even. Is it going to be a not guilty verdict? This was the first time in the UK that the prosecution were trying to obtain a conviction using familial DNA in the absence of a body. And they had to prove both that Helen was dead and that Ian Sims had murdered her. The Crown painted a picture of what they believed happened on Tuesday the 9th of February 1988. According to witness reports, Helen had got off her bus at 5.15 and was last seen walking round the corner towards the Georgian Dragon pub on her way back home. Helen. It's then alleged Helen. that Ian Sims beckoned her over. Come here. Talk to you about the other night. I said to the police she would have gone over and spoke to him. She wouldn't have been frightened of him. Helen had had an argument in the pub two days earlier, so there was speculation that she might have wanted to clear the air. Helen, about ten minutes later, a witness said he heard a scream which stopped abruptly. When I heard about the scream that was heard, I knew instinctively that that was Helen's last scream. The prosecution alleged that Ian Sims lured Helen to the bottom of the stairs that led to his flat above the pub, and this is where the attack started. Forensic evidence suggested that Sims had assaulted Helen, then dragged her body across the floor, and then strangled her with the electrical flex. The prosecution then alleged that at some point that evening or early the next morning, Ian Sims put Helen in the boot of his car and dumped her body. Sims claimed that the blood found in the boot of his car had belonged to his pet dog, which had cut its paw. Police found that the blood, both in the boot and inside the pub, belonged not to Sims or his dog or his wife or his mistress, but was 126,000 times more likely to belong to a member of the McCourt family. Men's clothes covered in what the prosecution alleged was Helen's blood had been found on muddy ground 15 miles away. The prosecution brought in geologists to help prove that it had been Sims who had dumped them there. The mud that was retrieved from two of Sims's rings and a bracelet that he was wearing when questioned by police was found to be a perfect match with mud found on his clothes. Vital forensic evidence was also found on Helen's clothing, which had been recovered two miles from where Ian Sims' clothes had been left. A lot of carpet fibres were found on Helen's coat, which matched the carpet in the Georgian Dragon and suggested that her body had been dragged forcefully across the carpet. Dog hairs found on Helen's clothing also proved to be from Sims's own pet. 
Along with the clothing, an electrical flex had been found. The flex was shown to have teeth mark in it, which Sims himself admitted belonged to his own dog. Forensic examination also discovered that this flex had Helen's hair in it. The flex had been fashioned into a noose, and the prosecution used this evidence to suggest that Helen had been strangled with it. I couldn't believe how strong all the evidence was. Fibres of her green mitts found in his jacket pockets, and these mitts had been brought, given to her as a present, by her previous boyfriend's grandma, who had bought them in Canada. You know, so you couldn't buy them in this country. The prosecution also produced a number of witness statements from people in the bar the night that Helen had been involved in an argument with another girl. They all stated they overheard Sims saying that he hated Helen. However, on the contrary, Sims claimed in court that one night he'd been briefly intimate with Helen after an all-night drinking session. Whatever the truth about their relationship, the fact was that the prosecution had presented enough evidence linking Sims to the crime. Ian Sims didn't really dispute the forensic evidence that was against him. However, he did suggest that he had been framed. Ian Sims gave his evidence over one and a half days. He claimed that someone had broken into his flat, murdered Helen, put on his jeans which had been drying on a radiator, and then taken his car to dump the body. He also alleged someone planted his stolen clothes 15 miles away. He said, and he was going like this with his finger, you know, do you think, he goes, if I was going to do something like that, do you think I'd have left me clothes in the middle of a public footpath where anyone could find them? A lot of people felt that his defence was desperate and insulting. So convincing was the evidence against him. You know, the fact that somebody breaking in, stealing his clothes, his car, etc., then putting everything back after they had murdered Helen. You just think, why on earth do you come out with a defence like that? It, it is just so laughable. But some people didn't believe Ian Sims was guilty. I think the village were quite split. A lot of people who knew him still thought, well, he's innocent and he's going to be found innocent. There was a feeling that, well, he's not done it and he will be freed afterwards. In court, Helen's family wanted answers. I was willing him to look at me because my hair had grown longer. Um, I was actually wearing one of Helen's suits, uh, her work suits, which she wore when she went to the pub as well. I just wanted this man to look at me and see Helen and show remorse and say what he'd done. That's all I wanted. And uh, he, he just never did. Over the course of three weeks, the prosecution presented a case based on mountains of forensic evidence and the revolutionary DNA profiling. But with no body having been found, would it be enough for the jury to convict Ian Sims? On March the 14th, 1989, a jury of five men and seven women took just five and a half hours to find Ian Sims guilty of Helen McCourt's murder. There was uproar in the court with cheering and applause from the McCourt family. It was like a pressure cooker exploding. Um, it, was, it was elation inside, but tinged with, well, now we know what it's all about. Um, and to see him still shaking his head and trying to deny that he was the person was, was unbelievable. But for Mary, despite the guilty verdict, there were still questions that desperately needed answering. It didn't really mean anything, because all as I wanted was for him to tell me where Helen's body could be recovered from. It was a groundbreaking case because it was one of the first times in the UK that a killer had been convicted on DNA evidence in the absence of a body. The police went ahead with the DNA. I believe they could get him found guilty just with the DNA alone, without all the other evidence that they had on him. Ian Sims was given a life sentence but still maintains his innocence. 
He's tried to get the case reheard on a number of occasions. And 14 years after his conviction in 2004, he got the results of the Criminal Case Review Commission. Now, with the improvements in DNA testing, what had been 168,000 to one possibility of the blood being from Helen, it's now showing that it's nine and a half million to one that the blood that was found in the pub was from Helen. So effectively, he's gone for a case review, but the case against him has been proven to be even more concrete than it was when he made his application. So 25 years on, Ian Sims is still in prison. He has never confessed or admitted what he did with Helen's body, which is part of the reason why he's been refused parole so far. For the village of Billinge, life has never been the same since that stormy February evening. I don't think the village of Billinge has completely recovered from that tragic event 25 years to this day. It is still haunted by that unanswered question of where her body may lie. I think it's now just become part of what Billinge is known for. And I do think that if you mention that you're from there, somebody quite often will say, oh, remember that incident. For the community, it's been horrific because Bullinch was just a small village. It was not on the map, basically, really, in that way. And because of the horrific thing that happened here 25 years ago over my daughter Helen, you know, maybe it stops people from moving on because when they go out, I'm sure that, like me, they're also looking in fields and down the side of drains and sewers and things like that and thinking, oh, I wonder if that, that looks a bit thingy down there. I wonder if Helen, that, that could be somewhere where Helen could have been placed. The search for Helen's body still continues. And in October 2013, the police excavated a grave in the village after new information emerged that it had been open on the day Helen went missing. Because the grave digger, a connection with Sims, there was enough evidence for that exhumation to go ahead. Unfortunately, it uh, still didn't reveal where Helen was. It was yet another setback for the family who have never been able to give Helen the burial she deserves. Instead, they erected a memorial in her honor to mark the 20th anniversary of when she went missing. She's never far from their thoughts. Me and Helen were extremely close. She was my only sister. And because of what he's done, um, it's left a large hole in my life. She's always in your thoughts, especially when it's coming round to the time of the incident and her birthday in July. Um, she's always there. My daughter's second name is named after her um, because she was a big part of my life. And she would have still been my friend, I feel. And I still feel that we all miss her as we do. She'd be a mother, she would have made a good mother because she was great with children. You know, you go to family parties and you look around and you think, yes, she'd be here, she'd have a glass of wine, she'd be enjoying herself. And that, she just left that huge space which nobody else could fill. And there is no peace for Mary McCourt. The first thing I do every morning is put the television on to listen to the news. Has a body been found? It's happened on numerous occasions, and I'm always hoping that one day it will be Helen's body that's found. I don't know how Ian Sims can live with his conscience, knowing he could end my nightmare and torture like that, just by saying, yes, I did it. I'm sorry, or whatever reason he did it for, and this is where you can find her. That's all I want, is for him to end this nightmare. Pig trusting no one and discovering some shocking true crimes. Britain's Most Evil Killers is Monday at 9. And for something new that might just keep you awake at night, get into some paranormal activity in a haunting Monday at 10.